scripture reading is found in the book of Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verses 1 to 8. And so I'll invite you to stand as we uh, read the scripture passage for today. Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated from his people separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my, I will give in my house and within my walls a place in the name. Better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted in my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations." The Lord God, who gathers the outcast of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Please be seated. Well, good morning. And uh, MJ, thank you for the cough drops. I did actually have some of my own, they're not really cough drops, they're ginger chews, and they get a little chewy and they're a little kind of challenging. Yours are a little bit easier to, to take, <clears throat> particularly in a speaking environment like this, but thank you very, very, very much. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us into this new year, and we pray that the grace and the power of your Holy Spirit would be with us as we open your word. It's my prayer that as your word is open before us, that our hearts would be open to you and that your spirit would speak to us and that we would hear. We pray for our YouTube and our Facebook audience. We don't know how many are out there, but they're welcome to join us here today. Very excited that they're joining us. And we pray that their blessing would be sweet and very rich. And so we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you and to spend time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> One more thing, Nick, I don't know if you're there. Do I need to turn on my the clip-on mic, or we're going to stay with this microphone? All right, he... <clears throat> All right, well, I turned it on, so... It sounds like it's about to feed back if you want to bring it down because I think you had turned it up because it wasn't on <laughs> and that was my fault, not yours. Well, Fred had asked me a few days ago, I think it was last Sabbath when I was here or two Sabbaths ago, whatever it was, what's your next series going to be? Because I had been preaching on the Word of God, the Bible. And I said to him, prayer. And he mentioned he had just done a series on prayer. I don't know how long ago, but it, and that's fine. But, you know, really, as the pastor, to be quite honest with you, I came in the right order, uh, Bible first and then prayer, but, you know, I don't want to say it's sick of one half a dozen of the other, but both are vitally important, and none's more important than the other. You can't do one without the other. And, but uh, I, I wanted to establish the foundation, and that was the Bible, because all things spring from Scripture. Amen? 
and you'll have to excuse me and let me indulge in my H2O here because that will help my throat. <clears> throat> um, a house of prayer for all nations. What do you think about that idea? Does it excite you? What if we became a house of prayer for all nations? <clears throat> uh, that idea, that concept, that phrase first occurs in the scripture reading that Fred read to us ago. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8, gives the whole context <coughs> appears in verse 7 in particular. It says, Even them I will bring to my holy prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a now, the context of that... Okay, we're going to cut this one off. Let's just boldly go into the future, huh? All right. Well, the context, as you might have picked up from what Fred was talking, read, when Fred read to us just a few moments ago, the Lord calls for his people to do righteousness and to keep justice. And because he declares that his salvation is about to come. And his righteousness will be revealed. <coughs> and he pronounces a blessing upon those who, um, who do this. But then the circle is widened or broadened further to the Gentiles. And to say they are also included in this covenant. And he goes on and he says, Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Uh, nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And to the sons of the foreigner, <coughs> excuse me, who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So the idea is that God's people are everywhere. And they're invited to come and to participate in the house of prayer and, be, and to be welcome here. <coughs> now, that phrase occurs, like I said, here in Isaiah, but where does the idea originate? This is where the word, the phrase first appears, house of prayer. <clears throat> but where does the idea come from? Where would that come from? <clears throat> well, we can go to, <clears throat> excuse me, Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. And this is after Solomon had built the temple. There had been the tabernacle, the tent-like meeting place, the tent tabernacle. <coughs> but then Solomon had been commissioned by God to build the, uh, the actual temple structure. And here, after the temple had been built, the Bible says, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, <coughs> who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, 
and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So that's the promise that God made to his people. <clears throat> that this place was dedicated to be a house of sacrifice, but also where prayer would uh, play a large role. But there were consequences uh, if they failed to do this. And that's found in 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 19 to 22. The Lord went on to continue to tell Solomon, <clears throat> But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, <coughs> because they forsook the Lord of their God, the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity upon them. So Isaiah tells us that God's house is a house of prayer, but that concept goes back all the way to Solomon's time when the temple was first dedicated as a house of sacrifice, but also where God's people could come and pray. And, but there were, there were blessings and curses. God would bless them if they remained faithful to him, but if they didn't, then there would be consequences for their actions. And what we can do is we can go to our Bibles to see the record of what actually transpired. Second Chronicles chapter 36. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 36 verses 15 to 20. After repeated warnings to come back to God through his prophets. Here's what the Bible tells us. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. I have to say that might be one of the saddest passages in all of Scripture. That God repeatedly warned his people to turn back to him, to come back to him. <clears throat> but it came to a point where there was no remedy. The passage goes on to say, Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its places with fire, and destroyed <clears throat> all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons 
until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Well, as sobering as that passage is as to what happened to God's people and to God's house as a result of the actions and the lives that God's people chose to live, praise God, it doesn't end there. Amen? There's good news. And the good news is this, is that God restored the, the building of the temple. I have just one passage here. There's, we can go to many. <coughs> Excuse me. But I've chosen Haggai. Prophet Haggai. And, uh, chapter 1. And uh, several verses that I've pulled out. <coughs> and it reads, if you have to use your table of contents to find Haggai, don't be ashamed. Do it. It's better than just not opening your Bible at all and looking on the screen. The screen, by the way, is for those in YouTube land. It's not for you folks. You folks who have your Bibles need to look it up. All right? <clears throat> but Haggai says, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in the paneled houses and this temple lie in ruins? Okay, this was the temple that lay in destruction from when the Babylonians had destroyed it. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke to the Lord's message to the people, saying, <clears throat> I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. So the temple was rebuilt. But what became of that temple? Well, when we go to the gospel, and this appears in Mark's gospel as well as Luke, but I pulled up Matthew's gospel. You'll recall this story. As Jesus, <clears throat> in Passion Week, he went and visited the temple. And it says in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So, what we're seeing so far is God has an intention for his house. His people rise to the occasion, build it, accomplish it, establish it, consecrate it. But then they fall into idolatry. And God tries to, over many years, generations, he tries to restore the purpose for the house of God. <coughs> but there is a little bit of revival, but then they go back, and then there's some re more revival, but then they go back to their ways, and, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it just kind of unwinds when it comes to this point where the Babylonians have to come in, and they destroy the place. God, in his mercy, sees to it that the People come back, they rebuild it. But again, after several years, several decades, generations, the house of God <clears throat> doesn't necessarily fall into disrepair so much as, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry about this. Doesn't fall into disrepair, <coughs> but misuse. 
And so it becomes, as Jesus identifies it, it's no longer a house of prayer, but a den of thieves. <coughs> what is the future of this house? Well, Matthew 24 <coughs> Verses 1 and 2. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. <coughs> and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus predicts <coughs> the ultimate destruction of that second temple. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as the New Testament unfolds and documents, letters are written, we have the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. in verses 1 through 6. And so I invite you to turn in your Bibles there. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he writes, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, meaning God, who appointed him, Jesus, <coughs> just as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one, meaning Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone. <clears throat> but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed <clears throat> was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now, <coughs> God had a house in Old Testament times known as Solomon's Temple, Temple was built, eventually destroyed. It was rebuilt. And Jesus himself predicted that it would be destroyed, and it was destroyed in 70 AD. When the author of Hebrews writes this, it's believed that it was written just prior to the destruction of that second temple, right before 70 AD. And the idea being that he was writing to the Hebrew Christians to help them transfer their faith from this earthly structure, which had held such, was held in such high regard by the Jewish people, to help strengthen their faith that <coughs> even though this temple will be destroyed, God has a temple in heaven, the earthly sanctuary. But in addition to that, in this particular passage, he's addressing that God's people are his house. And so... If God has a house of prayer for all nations, where is that house today? In our 
heart, yeah. It's, it's us individually, collectively, together. And the beauty of it is, is that we can go, wherever we go, God goes with us. You know, we, we've got to get out of this idea that when the door closes and we all leave after potluck, that God sits here twiddling his thumbs all week long <laughs> in this dark place and we turn down the heat and <laughs> gets a little chilly for him he puts on his sweater or something like that and he just sits here and waits for us to come back the following week no brethren it's not like that and you know that but but believe me we operate sometimes like that is we think in that paradigm and we have to we have to shun that we have to adopt this idea, as it says here, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony or a witness of those things which would be spoken afterward. <clears throat> but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, which means you, you are his house. If we are his house, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are in 2022 now. 2021 has passed. And we don't know what 2022 holds. We just have to stop predicting and all this kind of stuff. But what we do know, 2022 or regardless, is our faith in Christ. Amen? He will see us through. He will guide us through this year. And whether he chooses to come this year or the next or the next after that, we just know that we can hold firm the hope that we have that Christ is ours and we are his. <laughs> and on that note, because we have such a close union with Christ, we can talk with him. We can be that house of prayer. Whether we're driving through the foggy hills of Coventry on our way here, <laughs> Phil, like you and I did this morning, what a fog, you know? Or whether we're, you know, traveling on the Route 84 or, you know, whatever the case is. Whether we're going off to serve our country, whether we're on the other side of the world, to our friends who are watching on Facebook. The good news is, is that Christ is with us and we can talk to him. We can be that house of prayer wherever we're at.